How many of you are here at the Executive Speaker Series for the first time? Oh, lots of you. Okay. okay. Well, it is 11 o'clock now, so I'll start. Uh, for those of you uh, who I may not have met yet, I am Linda Hadley, and I serve as Dean of the Turner College of Business. And we have the Executive Speaker Series as our way of bringing the boardroom into the classroom. So we feature uh, speakers who are uh, successful entrepreneurs or executives in the community, and we have them come to speak to you. Uh, we have a real treat this morning that we have uh, Mr. William Taylor. Mr. Taylor is the um, owner and founder of William A. Taylor CPA and Associates. He is, um, he is a very interesting in that he is a star athlete as well as a very successful businessman and entrepreneur. He is a graduate of Tulane University in Louisiana where he earned his bachelor's degree and his master's degree in accounting. Uh, he excelled in uh, college. He was actually the valedictorian of his high school class. Is that right? I did read that. Yeah. Uh, he's the valedictorian of his high school class. But he went to college on, I think he had a choice. He could have gone on an athletic scholarship or an academic scholarship. But he had been named the uh, Louisiana Track and Field Athlete of the Year. He set records in track and field. Let's say uh, he holds Tulane University's high jump record to this very day, which is a real accomplishment. Uh, but he did not take his eye off of his academics, and he graduated with the bachelor's and master's degree. He um, started uh, his accounting firm in Columbus after having worked for several of the large um, accounting firms. He is licensed as an accountant in the state of Georgia as well as in Louisiana. He is very active in the community. He's received a lot of awards. Um, I won't go, I won't take up too much of your time telling them about all of your accomplishments. Uh, one of the things we ask them to do is to tell their personal story of their own journey, so he'll talk to you some about that. Uh, but he was named, for instance, uh, Georgia Trends Magazine, 40 Under 40, uh, recognizing his tremendous potential um, as a uh, successful business person at a very young age. Uh, he serves the community. He is a trustee, actually, of Columbus State University. Uh, I served with him on the advisory board of Synovus Bank uh, in Columbus. And um, he is also giving back to the community. He provides uh, funding for summer uh, sports camp programs for young people, but he also supports internships for students at Columbus State University's Turner College of Business, and he has hired a number of our students. Um, I won't say any more about him at this time. I'll let him speak of his own record, but we are so pleased to have. Join me in welcoming William Taylor. Thank you. All right. Can y'all hear me? Um, I'll do my best to get through what I've prepared because I'd like to take some questions. Um, as noted, I'm William. I'm a CPA, a CFP, PFS, uh, so certified public accountant, certified financial planner, and a personal financial specialist. I want to thank Dr. Hadley and the business school for inviting me. Uh, I hope that I could share some things with you all that make a difference. Um, and I appreciate y'all spending a little bit of time with me this morning. My story um, thus far, I'll compare it to the, the event that got me out of my community, which is the high jump in track and field. Some of you may be familiar with it, but the, the high jump is pretty much a, a technical event. There's a, a pad and a bar. You have to form this letter J, but there's a lot of engineering in the process. And as you're getting near the apron, there's a gravity and a force situation. So at the right moment, you have to exercise basically brute, brute force to get yourself airborne. But once you're airborne, you have to have a graceful transition or the situation won't work out. And I think that kind of summarizes my life because 
in my situation thus far, I've pretty much had to use brute force and graceful transitions to to get through barriers and accomplish everything that I've done and the people I work with have done thus far. Um, I grew up on a shrimp boat. I'm from a very small town in Louisiana, and if you all have seen Forrest Gump, I mean, that's the boat, just not the money. Uh, but it's pretty hard work. Um, the that boat i didn't know it at the time but that is a business i mean there's accounting going on there there's there's trying to make a profit trying not to lose money there's entrepreneurship so there are a lot of lessons to this day that i applied to it and i will reference shrimp boat until the day i die because it's pretty significant um in terms of you know, early life, I was a hard-working kid. As mentioned, a straight-A student, I was an award-winning trumpet player. And because of girls, I left the trumpet behind. I wish I would not have done it, just being honest. And now my kids are in the instruments, so I'm actually going to crank that back up so we can have maybe the, the Taylor family band at the house and, and do a little bit of jam sessions. but. Uh, in eighth grade, I had a surgery to stop me from growing. So I've been this tall since I was in the eighth grade. And when I had that surgery, there was only a 20% chance that I could ever run again or jog, let alone become an athlete. But because of two wonderful grandmothers, they basically told me that that, that 20% was not up to me or the physicians, it was up to God. And if I, if I continue to believe and I wanted to be an athlete, then I would be one. Um, and because of those two ladies, I kind of challenged myself in the 10th grade. Uh, and by the way, I missed my whole eighth grade year of school other than 28 days. I was bedridden all but 28 days of the school year, so eight months and a couple of days. Um, and in 10th grade, I decided to kind of believe in grandma, both of the grandmothers and, and God and my faith. And I was watching some guys play basketball. And in between their games, I decided to just walk on the court and see what I could do. Next thing I know, I jumped, I'm hanging on the rim. And I, I mean, it was kind of unbelievable for me if you really understand the surgery I had and, and where I came from. So on that day, kind of got with the family and my dad worked on an oil rig when he was not on the boat. Once he came in, we all talked and everyone allowed me to take the risk and pursue athletics. And it took about a month, but from the time I stepped on the track in the basketball court, I was a leading shot blocker in South Louisiana, and as y'all can see, I'm, I mean, I'm six feet tall. I'm not six eight, so I almost feel like the doc gave me a bionic leg because the most of my jumping was off one leg, not two, and the leg that I did most of the jumping on was the leg I had the surgery on. It was not the other leg. I had two grandmas who told me, do what I want, how I want, believe in God, and, and it, it would happen. So. Um, Track and field pretty much had become a promised land and the high jump took me to the mountaintop if there's, if there's an easy way, easy way to explain it. Um, and then academics provided the fuel I needed to continue traveling that path because Tulane considers itself the Harvard of the South. So you can't go in there and lollygag and think you're gonna stay there. And um, I used the athletic and academic accomplishments to lobby uh, to get into the master's program. And I was selected as one of the charter members. They only selected eight people. And I was selected to be a charter member. And um, I was the first minority in that class. So got to see some people this past weekend that I had not seen in 25 years and they they chose right. The, the school made the right selection. I mean, all eight of us have done well. Um, from Tulane, I transitioned to Arthur Anderson. 
Are y'all familiar with Enron? To the, there are some people who won't mention the firm. I'm very proud of being an Anderson alumni. And my boss, I mean, he taught us a lot. We don't know the details of what happened there, but I was a lowly staff member in that deal. I was just learning, not a decision maker. Um, did my time at Anderson. It was number one in the world. So again, it's, it was nothing to be ashamed of. We had an event a couple years ago. Everyone from the firm, 68,000 people are doing very well. Nobody suffered from that incident in case y'all did not know. Um, did that time after about three years, you know, I, I knew I wanted to open a firm, so I decided to transition. Ended up at a firm here in Columbus. I uh, did three years at that firm, and then in 2000, decided to go off on my own and start a firm, and we're now celebrating 20 years. We opened January 2nd, 2000. So we've been out here 20 years, uh, and things have been going well. In terms of the firm, we've got 17 people now. We have two locations. We'll probably be at 20 by next summer. We're exploring a third location. I've been looking at it pretty intensely because it will fit what we need to do in terms of our future growth. We uh, provide services to publicly traded organizations, businesses, families, privately held organizations. We try to touch our clients often, so we're not a firm where we're seeing people once a year. Um, we, we, we try to be a value provider. We want to be a resource in technical areas. We want quick turnaround when clients come to us with unforeseen project requests. And over the last five years, our goal has been to be the number one option when we provide a service that the big four provides. And I think that's unique because most firms our size would never want to mention the big four in the same sentence. But when it's us and them, we understand we don't have every resource they have. But if we provide that service, we want to be the number one option. And based upon the last three years and some awards we've received, we are the number one option when, when the service is needed and both of us offer it. Um, so it's, it makes us a little bit different. Um, with small businesses, we want to be able to touch owners. We want that intimate time with them. We want to help those businesses chart their course. We want to assist the families now so that they can enjoy their future because we don't want any small business client uh, in a situation where the business is really a job. It's a huge difference. If it's the, a job, you can never separate and enjoy the fruits of what you've done. Our core market within those small businesses have been working executives and licensed professionals. On the working side, our core group enjoys a pretty solid career uh, within organizations and they're moving up through management and th through executive type situations. On the business side, our core group of physicians, dentists, attorneys, insurance agents, uh, we, we deal with a lot of service providers. We are trying to help them grow those businesses to where it's a job and an investment. And everyone wants a return on investment, right? So we're, we're trying to push people in that direction. In terms of our firm, to date our growth has been pretty much organic. But we are transitioning because the world is changing. So we are no longer seeking just organic growth. We're in acquisition mode now. So in terms of mergers and acquisitions, we're entertaining those. There are people who want us and there are people we want. So it's good to be desired. Uh, but it's also good to be in a position to go and acquire organizations. So we're, we're thinking by, by December 2020, 
we, we should have done either an acquisition or been a part of a merger where we won't lose our identity. We have great talent in the firm. I'm the oldest person in the firm and everybody in there is smarter than me. So we are not, if we merge, we are going to have an identity if we acquire it and obviously we will automatically have an identity. We have clients in about 21 states, which is a little unique for a firm our size. Probably 60% of our revenue uh, is generated outside of Columbus, outside of Atlanta, outside of the state of Georgia. Um, we've got staff members that enjoy great work assignments. Those are, that's not everywhere our people have been, but we, we've been to some great places, London, England, New York, D.C., Miami, Florida, Orlando, New Orleans, Houston, Chicago, you name it. We've had, our people have had some great experiences and they're having fun. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, they're fueling the growth of the firm because we just have some talented folk in the organization. In terms of the company, on a daily basis, we, we try to aim for efficient processes. We want to deliver comprehensive products. We want an error-free environment. We want honesty, integrity, and loyalty. And in the end, we want to satisfy a client. And now, as I've learned, we need satisfied staff people too, because it's a lot of what happens within the firm is going to depend on how the folk who are employed at the firm feel. Um, we have a W3 concept, <coughs> wealth, worth, and wellness. And we believe that if a, if a client is financially, physically, and spiritually well, or they're shooting for that, they're going to have social and financial worth. If that wellness and that worth is there, then you're gonna generate wealth because a lot of people confuse wealth with rich. Rich is money. Wealth is having things that people are willing to pay for, so wealth results in what? Money. Does that make sense? So if you can be rich and lose a dollar and can't get it back, but if you're wealthy and something's producing it, does, do you have a chance for that dollar to come back? So our W3 concept is, is in play on a daily basis. And within that, the three has even more significance in that when we're dealing with clients, especially the smaller ones where we're touching them and we're involved, every three years we should see something significant happening with that client. It could be marriage or family and getting prepared for that. It could be an entrepreneur that is now generating a salary with our help that they used to have on the job they left behind. It can be an established business or entrepreneur that we are encouraging to buy the building. Because most of us, as we're working and owning businesses, we're gonna, we're gonna be sitting there more than we're sitting at home. So if you're gonna sit somewhere all day, we believe you should own it, or at least try to own it. Now in the South, that's pretty easy. As you get to Jersey and DC and Philly and New York, the strategy may change a bit. That's why it's W3. That's, you know, we, we're evaluating each client um, individually. Our vision is kinda in our slogan. Your growth, our inspiration. We want everybody to be in a better position today than they were yesterday, or, or we're not doing our job. Um, in terms of my role at the firm, the firm started with me and two people. And it's kind of a graceful transition. I keep, as I get in the air, I keep having to adjust, keep having to adjust. We had me and two people, we did everything. Then when I found I was working till one or two in the morning, hired another person. As, as we began managing people and growing and not being able to get our work done, we hired another person. I had children, they start taking up my time, hired another person. So I, and so on and so forth. Every time something happens, we hire another person. We just made a significant investment in technology, hired another person. 
So we, we're just trying to keep things moving and keep it going and continue with these transitions. And it almost seems like every time we're able to breathe, there's something else. Because we just came from Colorado and we were told robots are going to take over the profession. We're not panicking because we realize a robot can only do what you tell it to do. So now we're changing our continuing education and our processes so that we can work side by side with these robots. They're real. We saw them. Now, some of them aren't tangible. They're built into software, but they're robots. They have limited brains, but they're out there. So we're making that transition now. Uh, in terms of our business practices, we, we are leveraging technology right now. We're converting staff members from daily routines that used to be compliance to now being consultants. You have to be able to communicate with a the client. There's no more sitting in the room for two to five years and being able to be super smart and an expert on a comp compliance matter. You're going to take the phone call. They're going to see you in public. You're going to come to the meeting. You're going to have to talk. So the, the profession is transitioning more to consulting. So as you're meeting with people looking for internships, make sure in those interviews, you're showing those communication skills because if you have a friend, you can talk. That's the bottom line. If you have friends, family, you can talk. Just find those strengths and start transitioning that. Um, we are educating clients on simple items. Because if the robots are going to take care of the simple stuff, then we need to move to the complex items with the client. Hence, you have to be a consultant. We are stressing ownership more and more. And it doesn't mean you have to own a business. But whether you're in a corporate setting, business setting, entrepreneurial setting, as you progress, you better own something because money is getting harder and harder to come by and everything is becoming more expensive and there are only so many hours in a day. So we're pushing clients at every level. If you own stock, you own something. If you own a rental property, you own something. If you own a house, you own something. I hope that makes sense. You have to own something nowadays. You cannot float through life being a tenant or a renter in everything you do. You can be that in some things. And that's our opinion. That's not the golden rule, but it's working for the people that we're dealing with. And again, we're dealing in 20 plus states, so we get to see a lot. We already see economies that are crashing that Columbus knows nothing about. That doesn't mean we're smarter than anybody. We have clients in those areas. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, front page of USA Today, the San Francisco real estate market is collapsing. So there are things happening around us and if you're that consultant and you're talking more and you understand, you'll see it coming, but you also need to own something. You have to. Uh, and we also practice what we preach. Our clients are in most cases accomplished people. So when we suggest a strategy, there is a pretty good chance that somebody somewhere in our firm is implementing that strategy ourselves. Because when you start talking to accomplished folk, they're going to challenge you on an idea you have. So when it confidently comes out of your mouth, you better be able to confidently back it up with something. We give back. We give scholarships, internships, we do seminars. Some of them are paid, some are non-paid. Uh, we've even given students $5,000 to run their own business. We've had contests where you needed a, a driver's license and good grades. And the winner of the contest, we gave them the money, run this business. Very rewarding for the people who did it. And we even learned some things. Um, some of the lessons that have been learned to date, uh, keep God first, because it helps us have somebody to talk to all the time, good and bad. Um, make time for yourself, family, kids, relatives. 
while you're working because you, you got to give what you promised during the journey and at the end. So somebody needs to be there. And if you're talking to folk, they're going to be there. Nothing stays the same if you start out with goals. They're meant to be accomplished, but goals force you to adjust. They force it. It's forced if you have them. Win early and win often. Uh, winning prepares you for the response you're going to need when you lose. It also gives someone something to talk about when your name comes up and you're not around. <laughs> Win early, win often, because if you're winning and learning when you're losing, it's, it's a pretty good chance that you're going to be the, you're the end result of a positive conversation. Rumors spread faster than the truth. Push short-term distractions to the side. Push it to the right and left so you can continue focusing on the path in front of you. Everybody can't do what you do. We all need to learn that lesson. Um, in my case, everybody can own an organization. And I run Taylor CPA right now. The people who work there know I don't want to be the only owner. But I'm also an entrepreneur. I, I own and actively participate in other businesses. So you have to understand that everybody can't do what you do so once you understand that you learn to take advice and guidance from the right people because sometimes we're talking to the wrong people and when you have critics who always know what's best for you but have never done it offer them the opportunity to become your competition i mean i can tell you from personal experience i mean i've given critics clients they weren't bad clients, they just weren't the best for our firm. And we recommended them to some of our competition and critics, and we're still winning. So you have to be open to doing something other than retaliating in a non-positive way. Put everybody in position to keep focusing on what's right. Always do better and never rest on yesterday's outcome. If you continue educating yourself, and improving yourself for those of y'all who are own companies improving your companies and your overall situations you're going to keep moving even when times are bad you're going to be rescued when when the economy gets tight you may find that people flock to your firm because they've watched you they've seen you they've watched the people in your organization so if money gets tight even if other businesses have done nothing wrong you've set an example we've had that happen folk are like look like y'all know what you're doing there's nothing wrong with the other firm but things are getting tight we need help the only reason they thought to do that was because of the, ex the examples that we put out in the community um, and for people who want to be leaders, practice what you preach. What they'll be is what they'll, what they see is what they'll be does not only apply to children. It doesn't. I'm a CPA. And I told y'all in addition to that, I have a master's degree. Uh, I completed a 17 month program at the University of Georgia in 2013. I did it because I wanted to do it, but I also did it because staff members were telling me what they could not do working 50 and 60 hours a week they saw me beside them i went to a finance and investments program 17 months i drove i took classes from 6 to 10 at night still finished that situation where 90 to 95 percent of the clients i dealt with were not disgruntled but i showed people it could be done and after that not that it's just because of me but i've showed people i could do it we now have more cpas we've got people getting their master's degrees getting other certifications and they're showing people they're doing it inside the firm so you have to practice what you preach um, finally stay focused even if the level of focus drops below 100%, we, we can't all go through life believing that 110% is the only option. Sometimes we all are going to take a break, a mental break, whatever we want to call it. Just stay focused. 
Uh, over the last few years, I've experienced major obstacles. Overseeing the construction of a new office where I was counted as a co-general contractor. We've grown the firm, completely changed our technology to where people in the firm are teaching me how to do it. I uh, watched my kids become teenagers, the, and through all of that and every other staff member's issues in the firm, we produce record revenues. And as you've seen in some of the slides, we're right now, we're the reigning vendor of the year with Aflac. Worldwide, they deal with about 13,000 companies. They chose five. And our little old firm is one of the five. So you got to stay focused even when you're not at 100%. Um, so, you know, we get distracted, but we're not confused and we're very focused and committed to what we're doing. Um, so, you know, this community never has to worry about me or the firm dealing like we've done enough. Uh, I may come from a shrimp boat, but I'm motivated never to work on that boat again. When I go to that boat, it's for recreation and enjoyment. Uh, and as, as long as I'm breathing, that's gonna be the case when it comes to the boat. And for you, whatever your version of that boat is, don't forget it and use it to keep you motivated. Uh, but in closing, we're here to serve the community. We will continue applying the principles of the high jump, knowledge, resources, the support of the community to push through barriers in a way that promises that we will always support this community locally. We're gonna seek work we're doing, not begging people to recommend us for certain items. We're gonna grow employment opportunities everywhere we have an office and uh, continue with our diversity initiatives and just increase our levels of giving back. And in every seminar and engagement that I do, I always have a quote, I end with a quote. <laughs> There are many people who think they want to be matadors, only to find themselves in the ring with 2,000 pounds of bull bearing down on them. And then they discover that what they really wanted was to wear the tight pants and hear the crowd roar. So you can't fake it. That's all I'm saying. Whatever you're going to do, do it for real. Do not fake it, because that bull is going to find out how serious you are about what it is you're doing at that time. So I wanted to get through this and take questions. I hope I didn't go too fast or confuse anybody. And thank y'all. So. Let me start with a question. You went to Tulane and you got your undergraduate degree in accounting as well as your master's. At what point did you decide that you wanted to be an accountant? I ask that because so many of our students enter college not knowing what they want to major in. Many of them enter the business school and they know that they want some major in business, but they don't know that they want accounting versus finance versus marketing. So at what point, can you tell us a little bit about how you chose accounting? My, my path's a little different. Mm -hmm. I, I grew up in a community where education is just not priority. I knew I didn't want to be on that boat. I knew that. I liked the boat, but that's just too much work. Uh, in the 10th grade, my teacher told me that if I majored in accounting, I would never have to look for a job. So I started digging into the profession because when I spoke to folk, they were like, ah, you gotta do audit, you're gonna be a bean counter, you have to do a bunch of tax returns. But as I dug into it, I realized only medicine had an equivalent amount of disciplines in accounting. So I decided to stay that path. When I went to college, even though I doubted it a little bit, I never came off that path because I didn't have a lot of people to speak to in high school. But, you know, even now we, we do litigation support. I'm an expert witness in the courtroom. Got to be a CPA to do certain aspects of that. Uh, wealth creation seminars, I mean, tax planning stuff, just advising businesses and nonprofits. Stuff has nothing to do with accounting and tax, which is what everybody thinks, with audit and tax, which is what everybody thinks accounting is. So 
I'm, I'm answering your question. I wasn't confused in college. I had to do what I, could, what I needed to do to not go back to the boat. So um, hopefully that, that helps. <laughs> yes, sir. With over 60% or around 60% of your revenue and business outside of Georgia, what keeps you personally in Columbus? Uh, I like Columbus, man. I, um, I worked in New Orleans for a while, and my choices were Palm Beach because they went to work on a boat, and I thought that was the greatest thing ever, Charlotte and Atlanta. And my boss in New Orleans, he knew I was not going to be uh, an Anderson lifer, a career person. When I told him I was ready to go, he already knew where I wanted to go. But then he came to me and said, you're going to Columbus. I was like, Columbus, Ohio? He said, no, Georgia. And some y'all are too young, but when I was growing up, Coke cans used to say Columbus, Georgia, not Atlanta. That was the only time I had ever seen Columbus, Georgia. So. I was sent here by my bosses and they knew I wanted to open a firm and at when you're in the big four which was the big eight and big six when I was there everything is a puzzle you get assigned to your piece of the puzzle everyone has to put it together well that makes it kind of hard to open your own firm and they knew I had to work in an environment where I got to see everything so I was sent here and just fell in love with it. And I'm a water guy. I like the fact that I can get the clear water that looks like Jamaica in three hours, but then I can be in the mountains in three hours. So I, I mean, I'm never leaving. Yeah. Yeah. You you have to figure out what's your entertainment. My entertainment is not hanging out at the movies or a restaurant, I'm gone. And I can get, with the Atlanta airport, you can be anywhere in five hours in this country living in Columbus, and you can build a lot of wealth in Columbus. It's a very good place to build wealth. Y'all, you gotta open your minds. You all need to open that up. So, uh, you mentioned that, uh, like, basically a lot of stuff that I've been reading about in the industry about accounting and stuff, like a pivot to, you know, like financial services, and like I focus on certain skills like, you know, relationships and like the ability to like problem solve and stuff. And then you also talked about um, like machine, well you didn't talk about machine learning, but you talked about automation. Um, where were, you mentioned also, sorry, uh, your skill, yeah, like you noticed that you had a skill gap, so I was wondering where that applies. Yes, when, when we started seeing where the firm was headed, where the profession was headed, that was about 2011. And at that time, excuse me, back in 2011, we had a firm full of great people, but they were purely compliance and they were not gonna change. That was a skill gap based on where we are right now. So there is no one in the firm today that was there in 2011. We gave, we talked to people that could have made the transition and they said they were not gonna make it. So we had to make changes and we began our process of seeking more talent. So whereas back then all of our people were from basically here to 100 miles, now we have folk from Ohio, Massachusetts, Chicago, Illinois, New Orleans, Louisiana, I, we went to wherever we could get the talent and we've got five CSU alumni in the firm and they came from different places so it, we didn't have to keep going out there but we fill that gap by changing the level of talent in the firm. And that was, that was a pretty tough move if you heard what I said, it was rough. When you said Columbus is a good place to build wealth, do you mean that there are things about Columbus now that make it a place to build wealth, or that in the future it's growing and the circumstances are such that it will be a good place to build wealth? The past, the present, and the future. Um, I've tried to do some things right, which gets me invitations to 
boards with people like Dr. Alexander and Dean Hadley and other folk. So you get to see what's coming. We already know what's here and I've been a part of the past. There are opportunities here. You've got publicly traded companies here that do not exist with other cities that have 1.5 million, 1.2 million people in them. You have to respect that. You can't respect that unless you've been somewhere and you come back here. You've got airplane engine manufacturers. You've got a military base putting $400 million a year in this community. It's up to you to figure out how to get some of it. Rental property, buying stock, some of the things I mentioned before. There's, then the wages here, when I came to Columbus in 97, and if I'm wrong, don't kill me, but I'm not that far off. Of the seven markets or so in Georgia, Columbus was near the bottom in terms of what it paid people. Now it's number two. And I'm sure y'all can guess what's number one, but do you wanna go compete with six million people? Or do you wanna entertain yourself up there? And I'm not saying anything's wrong with it because I have an office there and a home. But if you can show your talent here and get noticed, would you rather show it here? Or do you wanna go and compete against six million people? Even if you wanna be there, maybe you show it here first, gain experience, train people beneath you, then go up there and say, hey, here's your next person to replace me. There's a way to get what you want, but there's wealth here and there's money here. And I think you all need to open your minds and, and start seeing it. People are being paid here in their corporate entrepreneurial and business situations. And licensed professionals, um, we used to keep the data. There are certain groups of licensed professionals that make 30% more money here than people in Atlanta. Now that doesn't mean Atlanta pays less, but if I only need to, if I can only see three of you here, and all three of you are good, but I got 500 choices up there, aren't they gonna take less money up there to get you to come to see them? Whereas if you're here, everybody's full, so you're just gonna go where you're comfortable and they're all good, right? Does that make sense? Yes. So the wealth has been here, is here now, and is gonna be here. Yes, sir. Um, thank you so much. What uh, prospect do you have for students for internship, students who are graduating or near graduation? What, what do I have? In prospect for internship for students. We have paid internships year round in our firm. Uh, if there's a Columbus State in here, student here right now that's either intern with us or intern and got a full time job, raise your hand. So we've got two that have been interns. One just finished. Um, and typically as we grow and we, and we have positions, we'll go back to the people that have been interns in our firm. And if you intern with our firm, you're gonna work. Uh, it's no, no copying, emptying trash cans, none of that stuff, you're going to work. And you're gonna be challenged. So if we challenge you and you get upset, you know, make sure you tell the whole story when you come back to school, talking about why you mad at Taylor CPA. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Let's talk a little bit about what you're looking for, not only in an intern, but who you're looking to hire, uh, college grads. We, um, we have this thing in the firm right now called the entrepreneurial spirit which was part of that transition in 2010-11 from compliance to consultant. So we wanna see an entrepreneurial spirit, meaning that person, as they learn, they're just gonna go and get it done. They're not gonna be afraid to make a mistake. It's okay to make a mistake if you can document to your superiors why you did it, because that allows you to develop and grow and take their job so they can move on to other things. Um, we're looking for people who don't mind looking a client in the eye. And as you become a subject matter expert, which means you've embraced the entrepreneurial spirit concept, you can hold your own in a disagreement and be professional about it. Uh, we also want people who are gonna contribute. 
blue or charcoal suit, white shirt, you had three colors of tie. You must work 80 to 100 hours a week or I don't like you. You, you have to put work first. I didn't know that was wrong until we, we got the batch of talent that we have now. So we want people to come in and contribute. Now we have folk because of the type of people we recruit, we have remote employees. Sometimes if people have kids have to stay home, they, they're getting the job done at home. They just let us know they're not coming. We've embraced technology. Um, we spend a lot of time enjoying each other. We have cultural discussions. Just They change that because the environment I came from, cultural discussion was a lawsuit. But the people we have in the firm now, they've taught us taught me and everybody else how to do it. We had fun and now we understand why different groups and cultures and races of people do different things and some of the stuff we've all embraced. So, I hope that's answering your question. That's what we're looking for. How many hours a week is the internship and what's the duration of the internship? Uh, our internships are typically four months. Every one of them starts out at somebody 20, 24 hours a week. They all start that way, but they go to 35, 40, 45 pretty quick. And if you come in and you're good and you know what you're doing, we're not gonna stop you from making money because we get the product that we need and you get to kind of prosper and everybody's watching. So they start out at 24 hours because we realize you have to go to school. And we've had interns where we have to tell them, go home and study. Because some people get too into it and we don't want to be the cause of a problem with Dean Hadley. Yes, ma'am. Do you, uh, are you primarily only looking for accounting majors or do you also um, hire IT majors? Right now, we have already said we have to find an IT person with some accounting background. We just left a conference last week in Colorado. There's negative unemployment in the CPA profession, and I didn't know what that meant, but there's negative unemployment because most firms are now hiring 20 to 40% of their people are not accounting majors, and they're hiring the accounting majors. And that goes back to that consultant situation. There are other majors where people are just more outgoing. So while we're always going to be CPA firms, firms are now saying, you know, we can bring these people in that tie into the major and then backdoor them back into the major because they already know how to deal with and talk to folk. So there's more opportunities outside of accounting majors in the CPA profession right now. And if you have any kind of technology background, you need to put that at the top of your resume. If you're an accounting major, we may not get you. The big corporations may scoop you up before the CPA firms even get to you, but I'll caution you, if you go the CPA firm route, they're gonna owe you a lot more money later on. Yes. I have a question. Uh, you said that originally uh, when you were hiring people, you were hiring from around the country, and now you've expanded it where you have five CSU grads on staff where you're also uh, offering internships often. What value does a CSU student bring to your business, and mm -hmm. how would you say that compares to other colleges of business, for instance, like Georgia Tech's business college? Well, this, the CSU grads we have now, they pay attention to detail, they speak very well, they can write in something other than shorthand, because I'm a stickler, you can't be a text message writer in my firm, because we write memos all the time. Um, they, they're personable. I mean, all of our CSU people, you, every company has issues. And they don't know that I pay attention, but I pay attention to things. Most of our CSU folk are liked by everybody. All of them are liked by more than 70% of the firm. And the dislike may not be personal, it may just be work style, but the, the CSU people are, 
doing well. I, and I, I could tell you now, the majority of our firm as of late, the hires have been Auburn and CSU. CSU gets their Masters of Accounting program going. Yeah, the school is going to give a lot of people a lot of problems in terms of our folk being taken out of this city. Because when we get to the Masters program and you can stay here and be ready for that exam, it's game over. I don't think anyone here will have a problem uh, getting any employment, CPA, corporate, school system, what have you, because outside of Atlanta, the biggest firms are right here in Columbus. You mentioned the CPA exam. Would you speak about that for just a minute? Some students I've heard uh, talk about, oh, I'd like to be an accountant, but I'm afraid of the CPA exam. Can you talk a little bit about that? The CPA exam first, and this is my opinion, it's the difference between an okay lifestyle and gaining a level of wealth, number one. Um, I once read an article saying that there were millions of accountants. There's less than a million CPAs. And as you start elevating with the people you deal with from someone owning a paint striping company, janitorial service, to a medical or dental practice, to an aflac or thesis, if you put the accountant in the room and the CPA in the room, before they even know which one is the smartest, which one do y'all think they're gonna give the opportunity first? The, the credential is very valuable. Um, right now, and again, if I'm wrong when y'all research this, I apologize, but I just left a situation, I don't know if it was a Colorado conference or a New Orleans, within the last three weeks where it was stated that uh, over half the CPAs in America are 65 years or older. So if you don't see an opportunity in that, something's wrong with you. And they mentioned it in the CFP and CPA space. Like over half in both licensed professions are, over, are approaching or over 65. And I think I don't know it was the, if it was the CPA or CFP profession, but 80%, 75 to 80% are over the age of 47. So again, if you don't see the, the benefit there, your salary is higher, you, you suffer a little bit on the front end. I do compare the profession to medical residency because physicians, they go through it. The first three to five years of residency, 80, 90, 100 hours a week for a little bit of money. But when they get done, I think all of y'all know what happens. In the CPA profession, five to seven years, you're learning, you're getting lots of notes back. You may call it ridicule, we call it constructive criticism. We're building that subject matter expert. And if you're putting that time in, by the time you're done, you've got X amount of years of experience. And I'll, I'll question somebody in here because we got some t-shirts and, and baseball caps. If you're, how many people know how many hours there are in a regular work year? Work hours. 2080. 2080. So, man, if he may, wherever Lauren is, I guess I got the stuff up here. I owe you something. You can come and figure it out. Um, so that equates to 40 hours in a week. So if you're working 60 hours a week because you're choosing to learn, not because you're being forced to, after two years, how many years have you worked? Three. Who said three? Three years. You see what I'm saying? So no, though we weren't being forced to work 100 hours a week because people just wanted to make money. They were trying to get us to five to seven years of work experience in a three to three and a half, four year period. Now, when we were doing it, it's horrible, but the people who understood, like I didn't think it was that bad. Plus I got to live in some cool, really cool cities when I was doing it. But when I was done, when I left there after three years, 
I tell my staff every Wednesday I had worked a week by noon. So that means every Wednesday by noon I had logged how many hours? 40. 40. And then I was working five to seven hours a week. Yeah, it was hard, but when I was done in three years, I had seven, eight years of work experience. I'm a subject matter expert somewhere, and in my case, it was research. Make sense? Again, uh, relative to the last question, how would you advise students to prepare for the sick year exam? Pay attention in school, because the last year of school is on the exam. And then when it's time to study, I can tell you, you have to go all out. Kill the, I need a vacation, because I just finished four or five years of school. Kill the reunion, there'll be another one. Just kill it. From May, from if you get out in May, from May to October, November, dig in. Close out the studying, knock out the exam. I didn't do that. I failed a couple times, but I, you know, I chose to do some different things. But when I passed, I passed, and I got it done quickly. I passed within the time period I was given. Um, I know some people, it took them years, but they didn't focus in. If, if you could just dig in, you can be like a Lauren Grant and one of your alumni who just dug in and killed it. I guess she walked out. She was in here. Um, we've got another person uh, in the firm just knocked out two parts, but they're digging in. So to each your own, but if you don't set aside the time to study, and I think... Um, if you put in, they recommend like 25 hours a week, put in 40. What's it going to hurt? The day you pass it, you're done. <coughs> yes, sir. There's Lauren. <laughs> Lauren is a CPA, one of your alumni. She dug in, knocked it out. So she did it. Y'all can do it. Devin's a CPA, Christopher Smith. We got one person halfway there. So... You just got to dig in. And I didn't mention that, but in our firm, we have a CPA exam program where we pay you two hours a day to study on firm time. Some of our people study 8 to 10, some study 3 to 5, some study 9 to 11, but we're paying you. And they make sure they're studying on the firm's time and that they get their paycheck. <laughs> but we offered it. So... You know, make sure you're looking for stuff like that. And when you're interviewing, if the firm doesn't have it, just ask them if they can set aside 10 hours a week for you to study. Bless somebody. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Because these days, accounting is all computerized. And the IT audit precedes the financial audit. So would you agree that in addition to the CPA, having the CISA or CISM or CISSP certifications are also valuable? Yeah, we have a few staff members that are going, if they're not already pursuing it, they're gonna be doing that very soon. Because the robots, that's technology. Uh, and then people on the audit side of the house, now they're not just auditing pieces of paper, they have to go audit the system and see what goes from here to that person, from them to this machine, to that wired account, et cetera. So it helps. Can you help any cybersecurity issues? Excuse me? Any issues with cybersecurity? We haven't had any yet. Um, because of some contracts we have, our cybersecurity measures have to equate to that of publicly traded companies. So we, we probably have more cybersecurity than most firms our size, but we, if we didn't, we couldn't secure the contracts that we have right now. It's a major issue and we have to provide a certificate and proof and a report from our IT people once a year. And speaking of that, would you mention just a little bit how a lot of your work comes from corporations? 
Uh, because I think sometimes students think of CPAs and they think of tax return preparation. Oh yeah, tax returns are about 13% of our revenue. Uh, we, we do a lot of uh, planning, business advisory, and then we provide support to publicly traded companies. And we're providing support now that we didn't know we could provide two years ago, but they showed us where we were qualified and gave us a shot. So uh, that whole tax return thing in the CPA profession, that's a myth. I mean, there are a lot of returns that are being done, but that's not the major source of revenue for most firms. Are there other questions? I have one more oh. question. For those that, uh, that have a, a preconceived notion that mathematics is needed to do accounting, what would you tell us to that? That mathematics is what now? Needed to major in accounting. That you have to be a strong math student to excel in accounting. Um, I don't know how to answer that question because if, I'm, I'm old school. You have to know some math because I'm, I'm real big in consulting and if you can't look a client in the eye and run some math in your head, eh, that's a problem for me. Uh, but technology masters are taking over. And if you understand technology, then I guess you can get away with not being strong in math, but I, I just don't feel like the profession should ever embrace that. So I, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I, you should be strong in math. I, I, that's the best answer I can give you on that one. Any other questions? Yes, sir. With the future of automation, in the workplace, what are your staff accountants going to have to do to continue uh, to add firm or add value to the firm? They're going to have to absolutely know how to read a financial statement. Got it. If you can't read it, you're not going to survive even <laughs> two to three years from now in the profession. <laughs> you're not going to survive. And that goes back to the consulting. You have to be able to be a partner with a client. Read the financials, understand what's there, be a partner with the client, and you are going to have to spend five to 10% of your week figuring out how to keep yourself and the firm relevant. We're about to, uh, and I guess I've let the cat out the bag with some of the staff here, but as when we get to January, we're gonna have a creative time component uh, of the work hours at Taylor CPA because all firm, the most progressive firms are doing it now. Five to 10% of everybody's salary goes to them being creative and submitting ideas to the firm for improvement. So we're about to have that starting in January. But you gotta read, you still have to have the foundation. That's what I need you to understand. If you can't read a financial, you don't know what a debit and a credit is, and asset, a liability, and revenue, expense, you, you're not going to make it. And you have to know that even more now. <coughs> you have to. Please join me in thanking Mr. Taylor.